Good morning, everyone. Let's try it again. Good morning. You guys are very loud this morning. It must be very nice outside. It is. It's beautiful. If you guys could, before you stand up this morning, grab the attendance pads on this inside aisle of each row. Go ahead and fill them out. Pass them down. That would be wonderful. We thank you in advance for that. Um, And finally, if you could stand up, we're going to learn a new song this morning, but I wanted to read through Psalm 47 because it comes straight from Scripture, what we're going to learn this morning. Psalm 47 says this, Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy, for the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the, of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. So this morning we're going to learn a song called As Loud As He Is Worthy. So we're, we're going to sing this song as loud as he is worthy because God is worthy. He's worthy to be praised. So I'm, we're going to learn the chorus this morning. And this is how it goes. And awesome is the Lord most high, ruler over earth and sky. Sing a song as loud as he is worthy. Sing again when you are done, and this praise to the Holy One. Sing a song as loud as he is worthy. All right, let's give that a shot. real on his throne he's alive and he fights for his own we are his and he is our Jehovah God there's a heritage chosen in love our inheritance dwelt among us the one who was and is and surely is to come listen awesome is the Lord Awesome is the Lord Most High, ruler over earth and sky. Sing a song as loud as he is worthy. Sing again when you are 
are done. Hand this praise to the Holy One. Sing a song as loud as He is worthy. I return and stepped into time. The water returned into wine. The dead were raised. The deaf sing praise. The blind could see. Then he died on a cross for our sin, and he conquered the grave, rose again, ascended into heaven with a shout of praise. And Jesus on his holy throne forever reigns. And awesome is the Lord most high. It sounded great. You give life. You give life. 
stars are set in motion, oh God. I see more glory and honor. What is man that you are mindful? The son of man that you would care for him. We see all glory and honor, oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, we will see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. In all the earth, you gave dominion to your children. You crown them, O oh God, with glory and honor. So we'll sing of your name, live our lives for your greatness, O oh God. And your glory and honor, O oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome. 
awesome are your ways How majestic is your name In all the earth Oh Lord, our Lord May we see your kingdom come Father, may your will be done In all the earth Listen to the earth is full The earth is full of the glory of God come make much of the name above all names creation cries out and every knee bows Jesus we crown you O Lord our Lord the earth is full of the glory of God come make much of the name above all names creation cries out and every knee bows Jesus we crown you O Lord our Lord O Lord our Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, oh how awesome are your ways. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, oh how awesome are your ways. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth, in all the earth. pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are just thankful to be in your presence, to be here this morning, to worship your holy name. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We, we sing praises to your name. We bring all glory and honor to you and you alone. Be with us as we continue to worship through your word that we would learn more about you, learn more about who you are to your people. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. All right, children, uh, K through third, you're now dismissed for Children's Church. You can head on out. No, I didn't say the rest of you could talk. You ever have a classroom like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we all have. We all have. Um, somebody told me that Pastor Ed is here. Pastor Ed's scarce. Where are you at? Yeah. Is, is Lee with you? There she is. I couldn't see her yet. Okay. Can I just, yeah. So, totally put on the spot, but do you want to share an update real quick? Come on up. All right. Now, I've heard, I've heard stories about people who overshare in services and how you would get them to come off the stage. 
Good morning, brother. How are you doing, Paul? I'm good. I'm good. There you are. Thank Go you. right ahead. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The challenge in that is to give a preacher a microphone, right? And uh, some of you will remind me how punctual I am. So I... Oh, I hear you're not on. Sorry. I, didn't I thought I turned it on, but there we go. Oh, right there. Now you're on. Yeah, there you go. Okay. There you are. Yep, there you are. It's good morning, church. So good to see you again. So good to be with you. Good to see familiar faces, new faces, and older faces. <laughs> Not that mine hasn't aged. Let me take just a moment and give you a uh, a quick update, somebody said in the hallway, how is retirement? And I had to remind them, we did not retire. We redeployed and God has been so great to us. Uh, just amazing opportunities of ministry in Africa and in India. Have not been back to Romania recently simply because I've been so busy in Africa and in India. Be back in India this fall doing another pastor's conference. We'll be in Egypt likely in uh, May or June uh, at, a, at a meeting there. Um, pastor's conference in Kenya that we organized back in 2014. We've been doing it almost every year. This year I'm not going, but God has graciously helped me recruit uh, a young man that's taking over that. And every year, we have about 400 pastors, Pastor Niall, in the middle of Kenya near Nakuru that comes. And they're just so eager. And they all know about Oikos. Now, that, that dates some of you, doesn't it? So, thank you so much. Uh, involved in two different ministries. Well, actually, three up until about a couple of weeks ago. Um, our own personal ministry, Share of the Life, which works under the umbrella of Spread Truth here in uh, Bloomington Normal. And that's the India and parts of uh, Africa that we do. Um, I'm the spiritual dean of PACS, uh, Pan African Academy of Christian Surgeons. God opened that door, and uh, I'm the pastor to about 300 surgeons in Africa. And I was just up in, in Chicago for a meeting there uh, for our semi-annual board meeting. It went uh, fantastic. It was great. Um, I'm, I'm leaving out something here that I wanted to share with you. Oh, last May, we are part of Cornerstone Baptist Church in near Florence, South Carolina. And last May, while I was in India, uh, Pastor Bill's texted, said, um, can you have time to chat? I said, well, it's 1.30 a.m., can we wait? And, <laughs> and anyway, he asked me if I would be the lead teaching pastor at a new church plant they were doing in Hartsville, a town about 15 miles from where we live. And um, I knew immediately that I should, and I very spiritually said, can I talk to Lee and pray about it? And so I said to Lee, uh, I told her, she said, what Pastor Bill want? This is after I got back home from India. And she said, Ed, you need to do this. And, and I've learned this, that God gives wisdom to me through my wife. So men, be all ears when your wife is speaking, okay? <laughs> all the ladies stood up and shouted, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that went really well. I knew I was, uh, I was terminal there because... Uh, Two weeks ago, they uh, invited a young man to come, and I like this guy. He's really great, so I'm just going to be his mentor for a while. That church running about 90 people now, so um, Cornerstone Baptist Church in Hartsfield, South Carolina. And so that's been really very good. God just continues to use us. His grace is so great. I think most of you know that our dear daughter-in-law, Amanda, Buddy's wife got her promotion to heaven very early in life at 46 last July. And um, it's been, it's different. But we have experienced the grace of God in ways we heard other people talk about and we knew was there, but now it became very, very personal. Amanda showed us all how to get her promotion to heaven with grace. She never complained one time over the four years that she suffered from that brain tumor. And um, on her very last day, she was concerned for her family. 
And so thank you so much. I know many of you have prayed for us and for Buddy and his three children, our grandchildren. So thank you so much for doing that. Lee is my partner, my team player in life, and we're just really enjoying life right now. And we were in this meeting in Chicago, and uh, our son Brad and his family still live here. They're on the back row back there. And so we can't come to Chicago without seeing them, and we can't come to see them without coming to Grace. So Pastor Niall, I don't ever know whether to let you know I'm coming or not, so I just show up. Thank you so much for allowing me a few minutes here. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot and bring you up. But pastors always have a word. You know we always have a word. So um, one time I was at a church. Oh, I shouldn't tell that story. Uh, I, was, I was at a church that I was at at one point in my life serving. And, and, and I was visiting and I didn't tell anybody. And I showed up and, you know, oh, come on up, Pastor Niall. You know, I come up and, and the pastor kind of held the microphone, you know, and let me say good morning. And that was it. He, he was off to the races. And I was like, this is not my time to share. But thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. So, okay. Um, we're going to pray. Um, I am well aware of the things uh, happening in Israel. I'm sure a lot of you are following the news of that attack from Iran. Um, and, and I do want to make a connection point before I pray for Israel today. And that is that um, on April 28th here at Grace Church, uh, we, during our education hour, which is the hour following this service, uh, we're going to have Ryan Karp from Chosen People Ministries come in, and he's going to share uh, a biblical view of Israel and, and kind of thinking about what's going on over there right now. And you were invited to that. Everyone at Grace Church is invited to that. It is during that Sunday school hour, and that will be over in the activity center. Uh, so we're going to go over there for that. Um, I'm not canceling your normal Sunday school class, but I am inviting you perhaps to think about canceling your normal class and, and coming over uh, and hearing Ryan. I think he has an important message for us. And he's done this, this particular message in some places in the Chicagoland area. And if you remember, Ryan Karp was with us last year to do uh, the Passover celebration with us. So anyway, hope you consider that April 28th. Let me pray and then we'll begin our sermon. Father, I do pray that you would uh, be with uh, Israel, your, your people, your, your people from old that we're even talking about this morning, your people that you've cared for over the centuries that you have preserved through evils and trials and, and yet uh, still attack to this day. Lord, we pray for your peace. We pray for your justice. And, and we pray for your people. Uh, even thinking about Ryan Karp coming here to share, uh, who has a huge heart, to tell Jewish people about Jesus. Uh, I, I just pray that your people would see you clearly in this situation and, and, and actually see your son for who he is as well. I pray that that would happen. And I do pray that you would cause peace to reign. Father, would you be with us now as we look at your word today, uh, as we look at a familiar passage uh, about uh, manna in the wilderness and what that means for us. Uh, may we see ourselves, even as we look at this group of people in the wilderness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16? Exodus chapter 16. If some of you are really new at Grace and you said, what happened to the Red Sea crossing? I was here last week, and it seems like you jumped over that. Uh, just to be aware, uh, that was Easter Sunday. So if you'd like to hear the Red Sea crossing, that's what we did for Easter. Uh, this is after Israel has uh, passed through the Red Sea and uh, really very much the birth of the nation of Israel from slaves to a people that are now free and on their way towards the promised land. So this is Exodus chapter 16. We're going to do 1 through 21. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. 
And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you, are, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it each one of you as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. And when they measured it with an an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they didn't listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. This year, uh, the staff is doing a book reading called Side by Side. It's a book by Edward Welch, and it's a book about walking side by side with people and doing ministry with them and to them and for them. But the interesting thing about the book is not that, not that it's super scholarly or not that the chapters are very long. In fact, I think everyone on staff likes that they're kind of short. Uh, but <clears throat> the interesting thing about it is the first half of the book— is not about your ministry to other people. The first half of the book is that you are in need. That you need people, pastor, ministry director, social worker, counselor. You are in the need. And then the second half of the book, which we haven't even gotten to yet, is what you do to step towards people with their needs. So I got to make a confession. I don't like being viewed as needy. I don't like calling on people to help take care of a need. I think I get worried that, and I think we all know somebody in your life that has a lot of needs. And, and, and it seems like they might have financial needs, they have physical needs, they have emotional needs, they have spiritual needs, and you wouldn't even know where to start to help with those needs. You don't even know what, what should happen. The needs are so deep and so great. And so I think that there's a natural resistance to say, there are some needy people in the church, but it's not me. I don't have needs like that. I'm self-sufficient. I am a self-made man. I don't need other people. And yet, what I see God doing in the wilderness is bringing his people to the place of need and understanding their neediness. Could you say that actually out loud? I am needy. And you don't have to do it right now. It'd be uncomfortable, right? But, but, 
Theoretically, could you say to somebody, could you say to a friend, I have needs? They'd say, oh boy, what are we getting into? <laughs> Needy people, gotta, I gotta be careful around them. I don't know, what, I don't know how to handle that. Um, Israel's left Egypt and their stomachs are growling. You can picture it, right? You're, you're walking in the wilderness and your stomach begins to growl and, and Johnny's pulling at dad's robe and hey, when are we gonna eat? I don't know, Johnny. And, and, and then mom is being asked, mom, what's the next meal? When are we gonna see bread? I'm hungry. You ever had hungry kids? You know what I'm talking about. And suddenly you say, well, maybe I can go without food a little bit, but, but my kids, I gotta make sure they have what they need. And, and, and you got to realize God brought them to the place of hunger. What does that even mean? I remember one time in Chicago, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was taking a group of four high school guys. Uh, we did some college tours. We went to Trinity, and we went to Wheaton, and we went to Moody, and we were kind of touring these different colleges. And it was just me and the guys and, uh, and then, it, and then uh, we were walking around downtown after the Moody Day, and, and they were so hungry. They did all these classes, and maybe they didn't eat much. I don't know. But, but those, some of those guys were so hungry. And I remember I said, you know, we'll go to, we'll go to Giordano's Pizza. You know, you got to fill some hungry guys up. And, and so we sat there, and there's like five of us at the table, and, and they start ordering. And, uh, and they ended up ordering three large pizzas. And I, and I said, now I know some of you guys aren't familiar with Giordano's, but you know the pizza's like this thick, you know? It's got a layer of cheese like that, you know? Like you don't know what you're doing. And they said, yes, we do. Three large pizzas. I'm like, well, if you're paying, all right, you know, okay. You know, so uh, they came out and there was nothing left over. So when God says to the people of Israel, I'm sending bread, collect as much as you can eat. I guess some people probably collected a little more. And teenage guys were like, pile it up, you know? We're gonna need a lot of that manna stuff. But, but it occurs to me that food is emotional. And if we're lacking, that's emotional. I've talked to people over the years sometimes that have been in need of food and, and we've directed them to food pantries. And, and you know, Grace Church is partnering with a food pantry right now. Uh, that more information, I think, will be in your bulletin. But we're, we're partnering with a food pantry and doing a collection next week. So keep that on your radar. Um, I've occasionally met people, though, where I've said, let's go to the food pantry. And they've said, no, because I, I want to buy certain things, you know, certain things that I want. And I'm like, how does that work? You know, I mean, I, a little bit demanding there, right? But... I know that we're all in the need. And I know that God is teaching Israel a lesson about being in the need in the wilderness. And so you know what the text says. The people of Israel begin to grumble against Moses and Aaron. This is what needy people do. Needy people like you and me, if you can admit it, which you should, we sin when we grumble because we're in need. They're not looking to God they're complaining about the need that they're perceiving. Moses and Aaron go out of their way to say, it's not us, you're complaining against God, and, and God shows up graciously. You notice that in, uh, when they all get together, uh, it says in verse 11, God shows up in the cloud, and his glory is there. I, I, I don't know what that's like. I, 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 I'm just trying to envision this giant cloud and, and maybe it's shining in the middle or, or something's happening in the cloud. And, 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 they, and they have this appearance of the glory of God. This group of grumblers gets to experience something of God's glory that day. And God with patience and care and compassion says, I'm going to feed you. It's going to be quail tonight. So you're going to have meat. And then in the morning and from here on, I'm going to cause this bread to be all over the ground. And when they see it, they say, what is it? Which is kind of what manna means. Well, what is it? Well, it's this white uh, substance on the ground that you have to boil or bake. It says that later in the text, by the way, that they boiled it or they baked it and, and, and they ate it. And, and, and as, it, as you collect it as much as you need for yourself, 
by the day, by the midday, it kind of evaporated in the sun. So God supplied everything that they needed each day in the wilderness, day by day by day. Every day it was there except the Sabbath day. You notice that we said on day six, God says, I'm going to send enough that you can collect it and save it. Now, the spiritual principle here is the same one in the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. The spiritual principle that God is teaching them is, I'm going to provide, but it's going to be one day at a time. That's even what I heard Pastor Ed say. You see other people that go through things and you see the grace of God in their life. But one day you may need to walk in that same grace that God supplies day by day by day. The principle is not give us this day our, our, give us this day our weekly bread or give us this year our yearly bread. We yearn for the yearly bread. Now, it would certainly be a mistake to try to apply this principle incredibly literally or woodenly. And by that, I mean, if you try to take this principle and say, well, does this mean I should go to the grocery store every day and never stock my cupboards? Because each day I'm going to receive what I need. I think you've missed the spiritual point. The point is God is saying, I'm not promising that I'm giving you this, this huge supply that's going to last you for a decade. What I am trying to teach you is that what you need for Sunday is going to be enough. And what you need for Monday is going to be enough. And if you just take this a day at a time, you will learn to depend on me. You will learn to trust me. And you will not fear for the future and what you will have at that time. Because you know the same God that supplied Sunday is going to supply Monday. Give us this day our daily bread. So what I want to do then uh, with the minutes that we have here is talk about why God set it up this way. Why did God set it up this way? Why couldn't the people of Israel have gathered a week's worth of bread, manna, and just cruise through the week? Why did God set it up so that if they tried to keep the manna overnight, it stank and it spoiled? Why did God set it up so that each day they had to go out and collect it? Why did Jesus tell us to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. And why did Matthew, the tax collector, who was probably well off, why did he need to pray that prayer? Why would wealthy people need to pray, give us this day our daily bread? Well, here's where we're going. I've got three supporting points to the spiritual principle of daily bread. Here's number one. And by the way, these uh, are... These are in your bulletins. If you'd like to take notes with me, uh, you're welcome to do that. Just pull out the sermon sheet and fill in the blanks as you go. Uh, number one is daily bread teaches us, teach us, teaches us, sorry for the typo, uh, to trust God more than anything or anyone. Daily bread teaches us to trust God more than anything or anyone. When I look at the text and I see the grumbling of the people, what I see them saying, I mean, it, it's shocking, isn't it, the way they said it? Verse 3, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Their complaining was, we remember Egypt. My answer is, really? Do you really remember Egypt? Do you remember the harsh slavery? Do you remember the beatings? Was it really a land of abundance for you? Is that where your memory goes? And there is a lesson here about memory. I think there's something there about how it always seems like presently we can always go there in our minds and say this is the worst time possible. And, and we forget the challenges of the past. I think that's what they're doing here. Or they're just embellishing, exaggerating, or flat out lying to say, we had it pretty good back there. Now, what are you going to do for us? Daily bread teaches us that God is to be trusted more than the Egyptians. 
what an insulting thing to say to God that the Egyptians did a better job taking care of us than God does. God is all about showing us, helping us see that he is the trustworthy one for each day. And it's not what's in my bank account. It's, it's not what I have for retirement. It's not what's in the cupboard. But that God is supplying the need day by day. He's given me the grace that I need. And that I can rely on him more than anything else. So I believe that's the first reason why God does this the way he doesn't. Here's another reason. Daily bread teaches us to pray to God. There, I got my grammar correct. Daily bread teaches us to pray to God for the right things. They're doing all this grumbling. What they could have done was just ask God. Jesus has parables about this. If, if you ask your dad for bread, is he going to give you a rock? Well, no. If you ask him for food, will he give you a snake? No. God knows how to give good gifts, and he's pleased when we come to him in our need. So there is a principle here of God in our neediness, God expects us to come to him. He doesn't say, why aren't you working harder? Unless you happen to be lazy, he might say that to you. But, but you got to remember, every day they had to get up in the morning and collect the manna. They had to work for it. They had to work for it. Even though God supplied it on the ground, they had to collect it each day. There was work to be done. God's providence is never opposed to his, uh, uh, our work. His, pr his provision is not opposed to us working hard. They actually worked hand in hand. And daily bread, though, it teaches us that we should pray to God for the things that we need, and we should pray for the right things. So, have you ever prayed to God that you would win the lottery? Probably shouldn't do that. Have you ever prayed that that bet would come through that you made? Going to Vegas this weekend, God, would you please supply? I've told my Vegas story, haven't I, of the person that, that likes to gamble? And I, th I don't think they went to Vegas, but uh, it was a person that liked to gamble, and they caught me after church and said, Pastor, I'm taking all my gambling earnings, and it's all going to missions. That makes it okay, right? <laughs> I believe he did give it to missions. Not sure it was right, but uh, okay. Uh, so daily bread forces me to not think about having huge storehouses where I'm storing things up for years and years and years, and it's all about me. Daily bread forces me to say, what if I have so much that, that, that I become too self-focused? None of us should be praying for yearly bread, and we don't. But do we yearn for yearly bread? You see, that puts something, that, that forces me to confront what I'm really after and what I'm really looking for. How are you praying? Another thing I'd say about daily bread is that it teaches us to obey God in our abundance or our poverty. It teaches us to obey God. God said in the beginning of this whole thing, this is a test. It's a test. I'm going to supply by the day, and you can't keep it overnight. There's no leftovers. Again, if you apply this woodenly, you would have no leftovers in your fridge. So we don't apply it in that wooden way that doesn't make any sense of the text. But there is a point here. There is a truthful point in that we are to obey God when he gives us more than what we need or when we don't feel like we have as much as we need. The temptation for us is when I have abundance— is that abundance primarily for me? Or could it be for missions? Could it be for God's ministry? If God supplies more than what you need, you have to ask the question, why did he give that to me? If God promises daily bread and he's given me enough for 10, 20 years, why did he do that? 
Because I didn't ask for it, presumably. But he gave it anyway. For them, the test was, are you going to try to keep it overnight? Are you going to try to stockpile it? That is a temptation for us today. How much can I stockpile? But poverty is the same way. When you're in poverty, you might say, well, I've got to work and I've got to work all the time and I've got to make ends meet and I can't take a break, I can't take a rest. The part that I did not read in this passage, because it is a full chapter of this, is you notice that, well, earlier God says it. He says, they're going to collect. And it says in verse 5, on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Now, if you don't know what he's talking about there, he's saying on the sixth day, you collect twice as much because the seventh day is a Sabbath day. And that's when you rest. And you don't collect manna. So, so this is weird. So you're saying days one through five, if we collect too much and keep it overnight, it's going to spoil. It, it's going to have uh, parasites and pests and getting into it. And it's going to stink really bad. But on the sixth day, none of that's going to happen. That, that's exactly what God is saying. If you trust me in it, I will do the miracle and supply what you need on the seventh day. If you trust me in it. And this is the question, this is the conversation we all have with ourselves. If I give more, can I trust God with it? If I increase my giving, is he going to be faithful? Now we know the Sunday school answer is yes, but in practice, do we live that way? God is testing us in our poverty or our abundance to see if we would obey. Paul says this uh, in 2 Corinthians which is basically a uh, missionary, th thank you for, for sending funds. It's a great missionary letter of thankfulness. And he says, you've given beyond your ability to give. Is, is, that, is that the, is their example our example? Is that how we use our money? See, daily bread teaches us something about the condition of our hearts and what we do with our abundance and whether we truly trust God to be faithful. And it also teaches us, there's a Sabbath thing in there too, where some of us are just workaholics. And we don't save time for the people or the things that are truly important. Do you weave rest into your week? Now I know we're not under the Old Testament law and the Sabbath laws, but God has woven into the creation narrative that you take a day and you rest on that day for the Lord rested on that day. And if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for us. So how does Sabbath rest look to you or do you not obey God in that way? See, Sabbath is an obedience issue. Do you rest? My rest will be at about two o'clock this afternoon, by the way. Um, <laughs> that's when my rest will happen. Um, This is what I think our problem is. Uh, Grayson, could you bring that box out of my bag there? I came across this story one time. These are Twinkies. They're on sale at Jewel Osco, actually. Two dollars. Two dollars. Uh, anybody never had a Twinkie? You guys need to come down after... And we're going to feed you a Twinkie. And we're going to take a picture and see if you like it, okay? I saw a couple in the balcony. Unless you don't eat things with a lot of preservatives. But, but that's the issue, right? So, uh, so years and years ago, uh, back in 2012, it was a different era, a different time. Uh, Hostess was in a lot of trouble. And, and they were going through bankruptcy. Remember that? And everybody was so scared they were going to never have their beloved Twinkies again. Well, there was a guy in Pennsylvania that said, uh, I'm going to buy a box and I'm going to keep it for a rainy day. And I'm going to open it because we all, we've all heard that they last forever, right? You know, decades later, there's Twinkies. And uh, so in the year 2020, 
probably pandemic related if you think about it. But in the year 2020, that Pennsylvania man decided to open his box of Twinkies. Now, of course, they're producing them again now. I mean, obviously they're producing them again. But, but uh, he decided to open his Twinkies and see what they were like. And he opened three of them. And, and he said, uh, one, when he opened it, he said uh, he bit into it. And uh, he said uh, it was pretty tough. It was like chewing something. Never what a cake should be like. Uh, one was really tough and he was kind of chewing it. And he opened another one and he said uh, it looked like something was growing in it. <laughs> I mean, they're vacuum sealed. How can that, you know, okay, all right. Uh, something was growing in it. And then another one he opened and it was pretty normal looking, but the cream had turned kind of a brownish color. So, you know. And of course, researchers heard this that this guy had done this because he made it onto the news and they're like, can you send us your Twinkies? We want to study them, you know? <laughs> Scientists. <laughs> that sounds like a good thing to spend money on. Let's research Twinkies. Well, my point being, we all tend to think these things last forever. They don't. <laughs> Eight years is too long. In fact, I Googled it and Google says 45 days. Is about all you can get. I looked at this box, and uh, this box says, uh, let's see, May 30th, 2024. So uh, that's, that's not that long. It's not too long. Uh, but 45 days is what they're supposed to last. Uh, I think, though, in our hearts, we are Twinkie people. <laughs> we want something that will last decades. But God is not a Twinkie God. He's a man of God. He's a daily bread God. And if you want him to fit into your way of how life should be, give us this year my yearly bread. Give me my Twinkies. God says, that's not how I do it. My bread lasts for a day, but you better believe it'll be there in the morning. It will be fresh. It will be new. It will not be vacuum sealed. It needs no preservatives. And oh, by the way, it'll taste like honey. That's what, that's what this, the Bible says. It tastes like wafers and honey. Now, I know for us, we're like, you know, we, 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 have, we have honey stuff going on here at Grace, uh, in, in the Grace Gardens, you know, and, and, and we do honey. And we always, we usually there's a chance to maybe purchase some of that if you'd like. But, but honey is not a plentiful thing for them in the wilderness, that's not like going to the candy store and buying your sugary stuff. It's like, this is a treat. This is a delight. This is delicious manna. And it tasted a little bit like honey. So, let me say something about Jesus Christ. Would you turn to John 6, 31? Some of you know exactly where I'm going with this. You know when people say, you don't really need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. Well, you'll never appreciate John 6 if you don't know Exodus 16. Jesus is having a conversation with people who don't believe him. And uh, he's having a conversation probably with some of the people that were fed during the great feeding of the 5,000. And in John 6, 31... We'll do 30. They're testing Jesus. Now, God is the God who tests. We don't test him. He tests us. But here they go. Verse 30. They say to him, What sign would you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from, the hev from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is not a Twinkie. He lasts in this illustration longer he is the bread of life. He has come down from heaven, just like the manna came down. And he gives his flesh 
for the life of the world. That's actually the conversation later in John 6, which is, you want us to eat your flesh? My, my flesh is food. I am the bread of life. And so Jesus satisfies the deepest spiritual hunger that we have. Do you know somebody that you think is needy and has almost a bottomless supply of needs? You know somebody like that? And when you talk to them and relate to them, you think to yourself, how could I ever, as, as a friend or as a church friend or, you know, a family member, how could I ever meet all those needs? Some of you may have kids in that, in that category of like, you think about your kids and you're like, they have bottomless needs. I don't even know what to do. I, I, you know, I just take my hands off because needs. Let me tell you something from a pastor to the church. If you, if you step in like you're going to solve everything, you're trying to take the place of the bread of life. And you will never satisfy them. You will never satisfy them. If you come like the hero, I mean, and Christians are supposed to do these kinds of things, right? I mean, like James says, if you see a brother in need, you can't say be warm and well-fed when they don't have what they need. You should help them. But I'm talking about a mindset that says, I'm the person. It's me. You're trying to take the place of the bread of life. But there's another problem with this in that some people say, I see so many needs that I just want to say, be warm and well fed. I just want to wish them well because I don't want to get close to those needs. They seem so deep. And what can I do? See, you got a problem too. Because God has called you to just take a part. Just one piece of the need. And I've reminded myself that over the years. As a pastor, I can just do a part. And if I can own my part and even define my part and tell the person this is my part, then they can say, thank you, pastor. I, I appreciate that. And they don't have to say, why won't you do more? No, I got a part. I've got a piece of this. And I believe as a Christian, I even owe you a piece of it because we're brothers and sisters in the same family. And I will not shut my ears out. I will not close my eyes to your great need. I will say, what is it that God may want me to contribute? And I'll do that. And I won't get pulled into the bottomless pit of need. You can't do it. You'll fall in and you'll be, you'll be in the same spot. So own a part, take a piece and love your brother and love your sister. That's what people have done for me because I am a needy person. And I don't think pastors are just givers. I think that they receive a lot from their churches and I have received from you. And I appreciate that. But you're no substitute for the bread of life. And if I'm not feeding on Christ every day, I'm not doing it right. And if you're here this morning and you're like, why won't they give more to me? Why won't they help me more? Why won't they show up more? Maybe you're the one in need and you're looking in the wrong place. Only Jesus can satisfy. So, last thing I want to say to you and then we're going to respond in worship and we'll sing a very appropriate song coming out of this sermon. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I believe sometimes God's mighty hand comes down and life is hard and we walk through a wilderness time of a little bit of hunger going on there. And, and Peter's advice Stay under God's mighty hand. Humble yourself under it. I believe the opposite of grumble is humble. I totally believe that. I totally believe that. Like, you can come at God like, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? 
Or you can humble yourself under his mighty hand and wait for him to lift you out of the circumstances that you're currently in and place you in better circumstances. That's the Peter principle. He will exalt you. So you stay where you're at. Humble yourself under his hand. Don't shake your fist. Cast your cares on him. You can throw them as hard as you want. Throw them all out there. And in due time, he will lift you out of that and put you somewhere else. What you can't do is grumble. That's a faithless act. That's grumbling. Whether you do it about God or about other people in your life, I noticed Moses and, Moses and Aaron say, your grumble is not against us. It's against him. How many times do you complain and it's really against God, but you're not even thinking about it? I believe the opposite of grumble is humble. And it pleases God that you would humble yourself under his mighty hand. Let me pray for you. Jesus, uh, many of us have what we need. And we have a supply that's great. Would you teach us to use it wisely? Jesus, some of us don't know what our next paycheck is going to be. We don't know how it's going to go. Would you supply all that's needed? Would you help us reorient our lives around the principle of daily bread, that you're the God of daily bread? Would you help us see that our greatest spiritual need is Jesus Christ, the bread of life? Father, I want to take a moment to pray for those that don't know you personally. Our message that we declare week in and week out is, Jesus, you came, you lived a sinless life that we never could, and, we died on, and you died on the cross for our sins. You paid the price, and then you were raised on the third day. Lord, I pray that if anybody has not received your forgiveness and doesn't have that relationship with you, Father, I pray that you would call them in this time. And that they would reach out to you with a simple prayer like, God, forgive me. I believe Christ has died for me. I'm ready to receive the bread of life this morning so that I would never hunger and thirst again. Father, would you save? Father, would you distribute that bread through us, the people of Grace Church, we have great things to offer our community. Father, I pray your blessing on our physical efforts, our tangible efforts to feed. I pray over the, the uh, food pantry collection next week. Pray that you would supply, that we could be a part of that. I pray over this time of also the love packages that we've been doing of collecting spirit, uh, Christian resources spiritual food for people, that you would also supply that to those that are in such desperate need. Again, I'll pray once more. Would you help us reorient our lives around the principle of daily bread so that we might be pleasing to you, pass the test, trust you, obey you. Help us live with dependence, even if that means we have some days where we wonder where it's going to come from. It would be better to have that than to build our bigger barns and be found at the end of life we've trusted in riches and not in you. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we respond?
Go for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnets sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mounts of thy redeeming love. By thy great help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Interpose his precious blood. Though that day when freed from sin, I shall see thy lovely face, clothed then in the blood washed linen how i'll sing thy wondrous grace come my lord no longer tarry take my ransom soul away send thine angels now to carry me to realms of endless day Seal it for thy courts Sorrow and dead in my sin, a lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began, sing, Oh, your grace, oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. 
My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, for oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made Rejoice as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested. looking people. <laughs> you look great. Uh, matter of fact, I've got to hug some of you and give some warm handshakes this morning, and that makes me feel great. Uh, I have an opportunity. Six o'clock this evening in the fireside room, the young adult group is going to host a uh, hymn sing, hymn sing and praise, and you're welcome to come. It's very organic. Don't dress to come. If you come, you may have an opportunity to meet uh, two of our special guests that we have downstairs in the room. And I'm, I, help me with the name. Melvin. Thank you, sorry, I forgot about Melvin and Edgar. So if you come tonight, you get to meet Melvin and Edgar. Six o'clock, fireside room. Come as you are, we'll sing some hymns and praise the Lord. Thank you, yeah. I almost forgot my announcement after that. Yes. With Edgar. Yes. Edgar. Okay. Uh, so uh, my last announcement is if you're going to, if you're going to have pizza with the pastors today at noon, we're so glad you're here today and we look forward to lunch with you. It's going to be over in the, uh, in the crossing, which is the youth room area. But um, if you're like, where is that? I'm the new person. How am I supposed to find that? Uh, we will meet you uh, here at noon, if you would like, and walk you over. Like, so meet in the foyer if you'd like to walk over. But it's in our gym. It's across from our gymnasium. Uh, so if you head over that way, you'll find us. Or 
we can walk you over. But so glad you're here today. Can't wait to eat some pizza with you, okay? So, um, all right, offering at your doors on the way out. I'm gonna pray a blessing over that and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this day and all that we've experienced. I pray that we have a great education hour where we uh, just kind of relax a bit and, and sit in these things that we've heard. Uh, and as we pursue other scriptures that you've given us to discuss, would you bless the education hour? Would you bless this offering that we're taking now this morning? Uh, would you use it for your kingdom work? Would you bless us as we go? We thank you because you are our great provider. And in humility, we just need to keep saying thank you. Thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.